Okay, so this will be part 16 of passing your um, helicopter check ride in a Robinson R44. And so we're moving on to just rapid fire questions again here. And uh, starting on the performance and the limitation parts of the uh, PTS. So first thing he's going to do, and I'm not going to pose a bunch of questions at you. I'm just going to remind you that you definitely want to be sure that you know how to use the uh, maximum uh, manifold pressure chart, the uh, B&E chart, uh, then the... Uh, hover charts, the IGE hover chart, and the OGE hover charts. All right. And rather than throw a bunch of questions at you on that, I'll just remind you that you want to be sure that you're well versed in how those charts uh, work, practice, do a few things, to make sure that there's no surprises on how to use the chart. All right. Okay. First question: What atmospheric conditions uh, produce a worsening in the uh, performance of the aircraft? And the answer is high, hot, and humid. So high altitude hot temperatures and high humidity all cause a degradation in the performance of the uh, helicopter. Specifically, the two things you're going to see is the ability of the aircraft to hover effectively and also it kills off the ability of the aircraft to climb. Next question, in the R44, what is the weight uh, limit per seat in an R44? And the answer is 300 pounds per seat. Next question, what is the weight limit for the uh, storage area under each of the seats? And the answer is 50 pounds per seat. And that 50 pounds has to be included in the total of the 300 pounds uh, for the seat weight uh, limit in the R44. In the R44, what speed is listed as uh, BY? It's also the maximum uh, rate of climb speed in, in cruise, basically. And the answer is 55 knots. It's also the speed that uh, takes the smallest amount of uh, power to maintain altitude. So the question could be asked that way. If I wanted to use the smallest amount of powder, power rather, in cruise flight to sustain altitude, what airspeed would I, uh, would I be shooting for? And the answer is 55 knots. All right, next question, what is the maximum uh, doors off speed in an R44? If you've got one or more of the doors off, what's your maximum speed that you're limited to? And the answer is 100 knots. Similar question, what's the maximum speed during an auto rotation? And the answer is 100 knots. If you encounter moderate to severe turbulence, what speed should you slow to? And the answer is 60 to 70 knots. Okay, next question, you, uh, your engine quits and you don't lower the collective, you're gonna get a blade stall. So at what percent uh, blade RPM does a blade stall occur? And the answer is 80% plus 1% per thousand feet. So if he was asked it a different way, he could say at, um, at 7,000 feet, uh, what uh, blade percent would a uh, blade stall occur? If your engine quit and you didn't lower the collective, 7,000 feet, what um, percent RPM would you get a blade stall basically and die? And the answer is 87%. 80% plus 1% per thousand feet. So next question uh, I'm going to ask of you concerning the high velocity curve. Uh, one of their favorite questions is, number one, do we ever normally operate within the shaded area of the high velocity curve? And the answer is yes, we do, within the knee, the knee of the high velocity curve during approach. Okay. Second part of that question is, okay, why is that considered relatively safe? It's considered relatively safe because during approach, you've got the collective down where you're only about a half inch off the stop anyway. If the engine actually quit, you could quickly get the collective down without truly getting a blade stall and actually have it in an auto rotation before you hit the ground. You would actually hit hard, but you still would not get a blade stall and you're still technically within an auto rotation. All right, next question. Why is there a shaded area here uh, in relatively high speeds here uh, on the high velocity curve? And the answer is because with every auto rotation as you enter the auto, the airflow changes from being driven down through the blades to being uh, going up through the blades driving them. That's always associated with the altitude loss of about 25 to as much as 40 to 50 feet. So you've got to be above that height, above the ground, if, if the engine quits for you to lower the collective and actually get it into an auto before you and the earth become one. So, All right, next we're going to likely ask you some questions about airspeed <clears throat> and altitude combinations. And they'll give you uh, a question like, okay, at zero airspeed, what altitude would be considered safe if your forward airspeed was zero? 
And there's two answers. The answer is number one, hover height, and then number two, 400 feet. If you look at the height velocity curve here at about 400 feet, this is sea level. So here at about 400 feet would be the top of the height velocity curve at sea level, right? Similar question, uh, at an airspeed of 20 knots, what would be a safe altitude? Again, two answers. Number one, hover height. And then if you look at an airspeed of 20 knots, right here it comes up, it's right at 300 feet. So at 20 knots forward airspeed, hover height, and 300 feet above the ground. Finally, if, we, if they said 40 knots, you're going 40 knots forward airspeed, what would be considered a safe height at 40 knots forward airspeed? And again, two answers. Number one, hover, hover height is always there. And then at 40 knots, it's right, 40 knots right there, it's right at 200 feet. Right? So if you just remember, zero airspeed is 400 feet, 20 knots is 300 feet, and 40 knots is 200 feet. It's a little easier to keep track of, and you can guesstimate um, distances, I'm sorry, airspeed combination and heights uh, in between those figures. All right, next question. For any given airspeed, uh, would the height that you would need to have above the ground to be able to successfully do an auto rotation, would it be higher as you go up in altitude or lower as you go up in altitude? And the answer, of course, is higher. You've got to put more of that thin air through the blades to drive them. So the higher the altitude you're at, the higher above the ground you would have to have for any given airspeed to be able to successfully uh, perform an auto rotation. Okay, next would be what uh, areas or situations can lead to a loss of tail rotor effectiveness, and there's three of them, right? First one is main rotor disc interference, right? That's where you have a crosswind 45 degree off the nose that blows the uh, vortice or vortex of the main rotor into the tail rotor. Number two is a tail rotor vortex ring state where you have pretty much a direct left crosswind, right? And the third is weather cocking or weather vaning where you have the wind directly off the uh, tail of the aircraft and there, there'll be a tendency to weather vane if you let the uh, tail come around very much at all. Okay, next question is, uh, if you had to taxi with a crosswind from the left, with a left crosswind, what could you do? What's the one thing you could do that would significantly reduce the chances of having a loss of tail rotor effectiveness with that left crosswind at a taxi? And the answer is keep your speed above translational lift during the taxi. Right? The higher the airspeed, the less likely, it's never zero risk, but much less likely to get a loss of tail rotor effectiveness if you keep the hover speed above translational lift. Okay, so that does it for part 16. We'll take this up again on part 17. And if you haven't done so yet, please like and subscribe, and we'll see you on the next video.